So me, I don't use Windows. I use uh, Linux is what I typically use. Okay, so then last time we were talking about we were talking about uh, where to find the extreme values uh, for a function. So then now I'm going to summarize that uh, with this remark: the extreme value theorem, which I think I probably wrote this down last time. It sounds like something I would have done. Okay, it is to say if f of x is continuous on the closed and bounded interval a to b, so if this is a fact, then <coughs> 1 f of x f of x obtains its absolute extrema so that's a first comment it has to obtain its absolute extrema that means it obtains its absolute maximum and it also obtains its absolute minimum okay but more than that because of the comments that we made last time you can tell me exactly where those extreme values have to occur where do they have to occur sorry okay so that's that's one place so, moreover, these extreme, extreme values occur, occur with a U, at <coughs> either A, they might occur at the endpoints of the interval. That is to say, it might be at X is A, or it might be at X is B. Okay, and if it's not at an endpoint, then it's at some point in the interior. And how will you find those points in the interior? Those are critical numbers, right? Critical numbers of f of x. That is to say, right, just to remind you, that's where the derivative is undefined or the derivative is zero. So now, I'd like to point something out as a matter of solving problems in my historical noticings. Okay, so then students very frequently think that critical number is synonymous with where the derivative is zero. It is not. Okay. This piece right here, looking for where the derivative is undefined, in my experience, students very frequently omit this for reasons I don't know. Okay, so any questions about this? Any questions? Okay, so then let's do an example of using the extreme value theorem. Okay, so example. Find the absolute extrema of f of x is how about, uh, let's say, what? 3x plus 3 over x <coughs> on the interval. Oh, no, let's not do it like that. Let's just make it x plus 1 over x because that'll make it easier. x plus 1 over x on, and I'll put the 3s here, 1 third to 3. Just as entertaining. <coughs> okay, so find the absolute extrema of this. So then now, very soon, this is, this is considered an optimization problem. I want you to find the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum. Okay, so very soon we're going to do more and more and more of these, so you're going to have several different contexts where you use a few different techniques. Right? Sometimes you'll use this technique, sometimes you'll use that technique. How do you know that the theorem you're supposed to use is the extreme value theorem? There's some key word here. Absolute, right? Absolute. This piece right here is telling you that you are going to use the extreme value theorem. Okay. So then, <coughs> the extreme value theorem says the following. We need to find the critical numbers. Okay, so then, in order to do that, first we'll compute the derivative. So then, before I even compute the derivative, I'm going to rewrite f of x in a manner that is more... Uh, 
that is easier to consider the derivative of, right? So then I'm going to write f of x like so. Okay, so I'm going to write it like that because when, when you are doing calculus, when you're computing derivatives and other things related to derivatives, it is more beneficial typically for you to look at this as a negative exponent rather than a fraction. Okay, that being the case, the derivative is 1 plus negative 1 x to the negative 2. Okay, so then after some simplification, you could say the derivative is 1 minus 1 over x squared. Okay? So now, we need to find where the derivative is undefined. So where is the derivative undefined? Okay, so then... I see that expression, and I can see that if I was to plug in x is 0, that would be a significant problem. However, however, yes, what was that? It's not in the domain, right? What's the domain? One. Okay, but that's, the, that's the, one of the points of me giving this question, because I want to draw this out, right? So then there are no places. There are none, because x equal to 0 is not in one-third to three. Okay, so does everybody see that? Okay, now, besides, besides the derivative being undefined, I also need to find where the derivative is zero. Okay, so then we'll solve the derivative is zero. So that's the same thing as saying that one minus one over x squared is zero. And after rearranging, I can come to here and say that something like this, one, uh, one is equal to one over x squared. Okay, so then now I'm going to do something that strictly speaking is not correct. Right? There's something that's slightly amiss here. So can I do this? Can I do that? So let me be more specific with my question. There are two questions. Can I do that? Can I do this operation in this question? And can I do this operation always? Right, so how did, how did I go? How did I go from this line, from the penultimate line to the ultimate line? How did I do that? I multiplied both sides of the equation by x squared, right? So I sort of did this, x squared, x squared. So the question now is, can you multiply both sides of an equation by just anything? No. No, if you're going to multiply both sides of an equation, then whatever you multiply by has to be non-zero. Right? Because, for example, if I take this equation right here, 1 is equal to 0, is that, or we'll do it like this, 1 is equal to 2, is that a true statement? Well, what if I, what if I take the equation and then I say, well, uh, I'll multiply both sides by 0, and then 0 is equal to 0, so that's a true statement. Right, so multiplication by 0 changed the truth value of the, of the equation. So can I multiply by x squared on both sides in this question? Yes. Why? Because 0 is not in the domain. So yes, I can do this, but I just want to draw this out because all the time I see students making this, ignoring this, right? So even there's this, you know, joke that, you know, I'm anomalous in my family that I'm a math major, almost everyone else is in construction or whatever, and they send me that joke, you know, that's like some sequence of operations and, and then they say, so one is equal to zero, and they're like, ha ha ha, tell me about that. And I'm like, well, you multiplied both sides of the equation by zero, and they're like, whatever. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> so, okay. Now, if you compute the square root of both sides, okay, so then the square root of one is one. So then now, what is the square root of x squared? Not x, not plus or minus x, the absolute value of x. 
the absolute value of x. I'm aware that your secondary school teachers probably told you it's plus or minus x, but I would like to ask you, so if I just sketch the square root function right now, right here, that's a function. It doesn't take two values. The value it takes is positive. It only takes one value. Okay, good. So that now, what this is telling us is that x might be negative 1 or it might be positive 1. But one of these does not belong. Which one does not belong? The negative one. Why doesn't it belong? It's not in the domain. Right, so that one doesn't belong due to doma domain considerations. Okay, so then, we found in our searching, right, we found three places, right? We found x is equal to 0, x is equal to negative 1, x is equal to positive 1, but we excluded two of those three. So all the time these questions go this way is that you'll find multiple places. And then you say, well, but actually a few of them I have to discard because of whatever reason. Okay, so then now, we're using the extreme value theorem, and the extreme value theorem says that the extreme values have to occur where and where. Where or where. Either at endpoints or critical numbers. Right, so then according to the extreme value theorem, we need to evaluate at three places. Right, x is one-third, that's the first endpoint. X is 1, that's the only critical number we found, and X is 3. Right, we have to evaluate at those three places. Okay, so we'll plug those into the original function. So F evaluate, so let me copy the original function down here so we can have it to look at. So F of X is X plus 1 over X. So then F evaluated at 1 third, well that's 1 third, and then 1 over 1 third is 3. So that's, what, 9 thirds plus 1 thirds is 10 thirds? Okay, so that's what we get at 1 third. Okay, so then now F evaluated at 1. F evaluated at 1, well, that's 1 plus 1 over 1, which is 1, which is 2, which is 6 thirds. So I'm just writing it over th in thirds so that I can compare it to the 10 thirds. Okay, so then now F evaluated at 3. Well, that's, uh, what, 3 plus 1 third, which is the same as 1 third plus 3, which is 10 thirds. So now, after all of this work and considerations, the extreme value theorem is telling you the following. We have constructed a list here, a list of numbers. And the current question from this list is, of these three numbers, which one is the smallest? So which one is it? Six thirds, right? Two. So the absolute min, the absolute min uh, occur is two, right? Which is six thirds, and it occurs at x is equal to one. That's where the absolute min occurs. Okay. Now. Again, considering these three numbers, the question now is, of these three numbers, which one is the biggest? Which one is the biggest? Ah, sort of confusing, right? Two of them are the biggest. So what is that saying? It means that the absolute... It, so what does the extreme value theorem say? It says two things. It guarantees the existence of an absolute max. So the absolute max exists. Ah, but what does it not guarantee? It doesn't guarantee the uniqueness of the absolute max. Right? It guarantees it exists at at least one place. But it might exist in multiple places. It didn't say anything about that. It would be just like me saying that I buried a million dollars for you. Well, that still, that still uh, is met if I buried five piles of one million dollars for you. Right. So then the absolute max occurs is ten-thirds and it occurs in two places. So <coughs> the absolute max is 
10 thirds and it occurs at x is 1 third and also at x is 3. Okay, so it occurs at two places. Okay, so that's interesting. I'd like to point out that in this whole argument we never even considered what the function looked like. Right? We never even looked at it. But nevertheless, without even looking at it, we just went through this very linguistic argument. Right? No pictures of any kind. And we're still able to say that the absolute maximum occurs here and here, and the absolute minimum occurs here. So then now, after that, let's consider uh, what the graph looks like. <coughs> Okay, so the graph will look like something like this. Okay, so this pink is not part of the graph. <coughs> so I'll make the graph green. Is that green? No, that's gray. This is green. Okay, so... Oh, that's a line. I don't want a line. <coughs> Okay, so those are asymptotes. My, my drawing ability, you know, is questionable. So whatever. Okay, so then now, <coughs> if, I dr if I indicate the domain now of this function, then that can be x is one-third, and this can be x is three. So this is x is one-third and this is x is three <coughs> okay so then these two points are at the same height right the maximum occurs in two places right at one-third and also at three in the cut that I made right we're cutting the graph just between one-third and three and between one-third and three where is the lowest place right, right there at one. So can you see those are the three places we evaluated and now just have a look at these three red points and now let me ask you a question. Of these three red points, which one is the lowest? Right, you can just look at it and say okay well it's that one right there. Okay, and of these three points, which, two, which ones, one or ones, are the highest? Right, the other two points. So does everybody get the, get the way it goes? Okay, so then now, <coughs> just as to sort of drive this point home, uh, just as an example, right? I won't ever give you an example like this, but I want you to understand that this is the way the examples are. <coughs> Oops. So then I can choose, you know, some some function like so. I can remember to choose the pin. Okay, so then, now, having a look at this graph, having a look at this graph, uh, are there any critical numbers? Yes. Okay, so then where do the critical, critical numbers occur, assuming that this is a cubic or something? Right, that they at the top here, right? And at the bottom here. So now let's say that, okay, this is the game we're going to play. I'm going to say, I want you to find the absolute extrema of this function between these two lines. Right, between these two. That's where I want you to do it. Between, between x is a, and x is b. So all the time, on the homework server, on quizzes, on exams, right? students try and tell me, that point right there, this one, that is the highest point between those two lines. All the time. That's the highest one. It is. It's a critical number. I found it. I plugged it in. It's the highest point. Okay, but what's wrong with that argument? It's not in between the lines. It's not in there. Okay, so then what the question really is, what the extreme value theorem is saying is that you evaluate at the end points and you find all of the critical points in between 
the critical numbers in between. And now of these three points, which one is the highest? Right, the right end point in this question. And of these three points, which one is the lowest? The middle one. Okay, so does everybody understand the way it goes? This one, I always put one like that in there to make sure to separate those students who are paying attention and those students who are not, because it's my job to do that kind of thing. Okay, so any question about this? <coughs> Good. So then let's move on. So here we find ourselves in section 3.2. <coughs> which is called Rolle's Theorem and the Mean Value Theorem. Okay, so Rolle is a guy named after a mathematician who's long since, uh, long since deceased, okay? And then the Mean Value Theorem is not as bad as it sounds, right? <laughs> course <coughs> okay that was bad that was bad all right fine okay so then so then here's Rolle's theorem so Rolle's theorem says the following if you have if you have a graph okay and then you choose a and B. Okay, and then we make the additional restriction on ourselves that, okay, we're going to make points at X is A and X is B. Right, so X is A and X is B. And we're going to choose two points that are at the same height. Say, like, this height. And it has to be at the same height over here. So that is to say, I'm about to draw a function f, and what is necessary is that f of a is equal to f of b. The two endpoints have to be at the same height. So now, in between these two endpoints, I need to draw a function which is, has two properties. It has to be continuous, okay, continuous, on the closed interval a to b. But more than that, I need it to be differentiable, that is to say smooth, between, right? So then this would not be okay, right? So then it wouldn't be okay to make it like pointy and then blah, 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 blah. That wouldn't be okay because it's, it's not differentiable at the pointy place. So that wouldn't be okay. Okay, so then let's draw something that is continuous and differentiable. So I'm just going to do something like this. Okay, so something that's smooth. <coughs> So Rolle's theorem says this, so I'll write that additional requirement, so f of x is differentiable on the open interval a to b. So if we have those three conditions, that I, we've drawn a function that, ha, that starts and ends at the same height, it is continuous over the closed interval and it is differentiable on the open interval, then Rolle's theorem says there is at least one x equal to c <coughs> in a to b, the open interval, such that the derivative evaluated at this c is equal to zero. So, that's the linguistic statement of Rolle's theorem. As a matter of geometry, what is that saying? There's at least one place, at least one place where the tangent is horizontal. So then have a look at the graph that I drew. Is there at least one place where the tangent is horizontal? Yes, I would say that on my graph there's more than one place. How many places would you say on my graph? Two, right? So then here's one. And here's one. Okay, so then there's a horizontal tangent, and here's a horizontal tangent. Okay, now I'd like to point out that notice, notice, there's one last thing I want to say, and that is here are two points on a graph, right? 
On this particular setup, we've said that they occur at the endpoints of an interval. But regardless, between any two points on a graph, I can draw a what? Starts with S, secant line. Right, secant line. So then I'll go ahead and draw the secant line now. Oops. <coughs> ah, keep doing that. The secant line. Okay, so how would you say the secant line and those two green lines I, I drew in are related? They are parallel. Parallel. Okay, so that's important because of the next thing we're going to say after we after we demonstrate Rolle's theorem. Okay, but notice what this is saying is that it's like saying I took a graph that was continuous and smooth, differentiable in between two points. I took the secant line and I was able to find a place, two places in this example, where the tangent line was parallel to the secant line. Okay, good. So then now let's demonstrate that this has to be true. Okay. So now let's sort of give, give a little bit of proof. <coughs> so we will say, so that we have something to say, we will say that f of a is f of b, right? Their common value, we're going to refer to it as d. Right? So I'm just giving that common height a name, d. <coughs> so the first case. So case one, if f of x is equal to d, that is to say that it's constant. Right? We just have some straight line in between those two places. Then what is the derivative? Okay, then the derivative of x is 0 for all x in a to b. And so then that's all that we needed to show. Right? Because what we need to show is we need to show that there's at least one place where the derivative is 0. And we just said, well, if it's constant, then it's 0 everywhere. So there's infinitely many places. So that is at least one. Okay, so does everybody see how this case is in some sense, the trivial case. For those of you that are math majors or are interested in this kind of thing, this kind of argument, these kinds of arguments almost always have a simple case like this. Okay, so then now, case two. If f of x is not constant, okay, if it's not constant, then there are two subcases. <laughs> There's the case when their f of x is greater than d for some x in a to b. Okay, so what that's saying is that, okay, if it's not constant, then when I started drawing it, it didn't, it didn't draw horizontally. It must have gone up a little bit, or it must have gone down a little bit. Okay? If it went up a little bit, that's the case we're, we're dealing with right here, is that we went up. Okay? So the graph must have gone up a little bit. Okay, then now, notice that the requirements of Rolle's theorem, a function is continuous on a closed and bounded interval. That means that the extreme value theorem applies. That means that this function has to obtain its extreme values. By the extreme value theorem, <coughs> f of x obtains its absolute max on the closed interval a to b. Right, that's what the extreme value theorem says. But we just said that there's some place in the middle 
right? There's some place in the middle where it got greater. What, what is the value of the function at the endpoints? We called it a name, we called it d. It's d at both endpoints. And we just said somewhere in the middle it's greater than d, so that means that the absolute max has to occur in the middle. It can't occur at the endpoints. So this means that the absolute max occurs at uh, occurs in a to b that is to say not at an endpoint okay now then i take further with the extreme value theorem the extreme value theorem says okay the the function has to get its extreme values and it's going to occur either at endpoints or in the interior somewhere. We just said it can't be at the endpoints, it has to be in the interior. And if the function obtains its absolute max at an interior point, then that point necessarily is a what? A critical number. So then the absolute max occurs at a critical number. And I'll call that x is equal to c. Now there's two different kinds of things that a critical number could be. A critical number could be where the function is blank or blank. Where, where its derivative is undefined or where its derivative is zero. So of those two cases, which is the one that we want? We want the derivative to be zero. So we must, there must be some other piece of information that we can use to rule out the case where the derivative could be undefined. What piece of information is that? It's differentiable, right? We said this function is differentiable. It's differentiable. That means that it doesn't have any critical numbers that are in the undefined category. It doesn't have any. All of its critical numbers are in the zero category, where the derivative is zero. So this is saying, right, this says that the derivative evaluated at C is undefined, or the derivative evaluated at C is zero, but f of x is differentiable on the open interval a to b. So this implies that f of c is defined, which implies that, uh, excuse me, f prime at c is defined and f prime evaluated at c is zero. Okay, but that's what we wanted to show, right? That's what we wanted to show. We wanted to say that there, there is at least one place, there is at least one place where the derivative is zero. Okay, now, understand the, the mathematician speak here, at least one place, right? That means that there could be one, there could be five billion, okay? But there's at least one of them. Okay, so then now, I'll say that there's another case, right? I could take the case when instead of going up, the function went down, right? So we considered the case where we drew the function entirely horizontally and we said, well, that one's trivial. Then we just went carefully through the case where we said, well, we started drawing up. So now I can say that, okay, there's a case when f of x uh, is less than d for x in a to b, and it's just exactly like the previous case. And that is to say that it's, it's exactly the same, except now I'll replace maximum with minimum and all of that kind of stuff. So then I'll just consider this case finished. Okay? So is everyone okay with Rolle's theorem? So Rolle's theorem depends strongly on the extreme value theorem, and the extreme value theorem depends strongly on the, <coughs> on the intermediate value theorem, which we didn't even, which we don't talk about in this class. Oh, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so any questions about the mean value theorem while my program crashes? <laughs> That's okay, I hit save five seconds ago. Oh, not that one. This one? No. That's right. So which, what is today, the 13th? Can't, oh, pff, okay, I get it. No, okay. Close. I, you know, I, I can't use this Microsoft stuff. This is really giving me the heebie-jeebies. Okay. <coughs> well,
No, it's the 14th. No? Tomorrow's the 14th? How did I get this? Oh, that's January. Okay. I'm glad someone can read. Okay. <clears throat> I depend on that kind of thing. Okay, so then Rolle's Theorem. So let's do an example of Rolle's Theorem. <clears throat> let's do an example of Rolle's Theorem. So for example, find all points guaranteed by Rolle's Theorem for f of x is x plus 1 over x on, now this should look really familiar to you, 1 third to 3. <coughs> so find all of the points guaranteed by Rolle's theorem. Okay, but first, the first instruction, is I, want you to, I want you to show that Rolle's theorem applies. Right, because Rolle's theorem has several requirements. Right, how many requirements? Three. There are three requirements. Right, so then I want you to remember the picture. The picture said that there has to be at least, at least one place where the tangent line is parallel to the secant line. Right, so then, in particular, the secant line set up in Rolle's theorem is that the secant line has to be horizontal, which means it has slope zero. Okay, so then, we need to show three things. One, is it a fact that f of three, f of one third is equal to f of three? So this is a question. Okay, so then let's verify that that's the case. So f of, oh, I need to make this bigger, don't I? It looks better when it's bigger. Okay, so f of one-third, f of one-third is equal to one-third plus uh, three, which is ten-thirds. Okay, so that's what the left endpoint is. The right endpoint, right, f evaluated at three, well, that's three plus one-third, and that's also ten-thirds. So is it a fact? Yes. All right, wonderful. Okay, so then that's the first requirement. The second requirement, <coughs> two, is f of x what? Continuous on where? Where does it have to be continuous? On the closed interval. Is it continuous on one-third to three? So this is a question. So is it? Okay, you need to explain to me why it's continuous. Okay, so, so F consists, F consists of two pieces, right? There is X and there is one over X, right? X is continuous for anything, right? It's a polynomial. Okay, how about one over X? Where is one over X continuous? Everywhere on its domain. So, so in particular, x and 1 over x, they are both belong to a category of functions that starts with e. What is it? Elementary functions, right? So then, so then x and 1 over x are elementary functions, which means that they are continuous on their domains. So what are the domains? What's the domain of x? The domain of x is anything. What's the domain of 1 over x? Anything not 0. So then there's the only problem, the only problem that could possibly happen is at 0. Are we protected from it? Yes. All right. So then that means that they're continuous on 1 third to 3. Okay, good. So the next question, so what is the next requirement? Yes, yeah, so is f of x differentiable on what? On what interval? 
not the closed interval. No, it's the open interval, and this is important. <laughs> On the open interval. Right, so what does that mean? That means that it is possible it is possible for it to be differentiable on the open interval and not differentiable at an endpoint, but that still is okay. It's still okay. Okay, so then that's a frequent thing that I do is I give you a function, I give you a setup to where the function is differentiable on the open interval, but not at one of the endpoints. And because I'm checking to see if you understand that Rolle's theorem does not require it to be differentiable at the endpoint, it requires it to be differentiable on the interior. Okay, so then, this is a question. Okay, so then the answer to the previous question was yes. Right? So this is a question, now on the third requirement. So how do we determine if it's differentiable? Well, you compute its derivative. So then its derivative is one minus one over x squared. So one minus one over x squared, again, that's elementary. It's elementary, so it is continuous on its domain. Right, so then this is an elementary function, continuous on its domain. And what is the domain of this function? Anything except zero, so are we protected from zero? Yes, so that means that yes, f of x is differentiable on the open interval one third to three. Okay, on the open interval one third to three. Uh, and this is, you know, basically because x equal to zero is <coughs> not in there. Okay, so then now that was the that was showing that Rolle's theorem applies. So the, the response is yes, Rolle's theorem applies. And it's very important for you to indicate that indicate that the that Rolle's theorem applies. If you go through all of this argument and then you don't make a conclusion, then the grader has to assume that after all of that argument you weren't able to make a conclusion. Right? You very carefully verified all three properties and then you couldn't remember. Right? That's the only thing the grader can assume. Right? So you have to write a conclusion. So then the conclusion is that yes Rolle's theorem applies. So now let's find all of the points that are guaranteed by Rolle's theorem. Okay, that is to say we need to solve f prime of x is equal to zero, but not just anywhere, where? Where is it? Something about the interval, but what interval is it? The open interval. Right, on the open interval. So then another thing that I frequently do, just because, I don't know, I guess it's how I am, I'll give you a place where the derivative is zero at an endpoint. Does Rolle's theorem say that there's going to be a zero at an endpoint? No, that is not one of the points that's guaranteed by Rolle's theorem. It's not. And so then a frequent occurrence is for, you know, during this part of the semester for a student to email me and say, you know, the machine is telling me to give it the points that are guaranteed by Rolle's theorem and I solved the derivative is zero on the closed interval and I gave it the points and it's not right. The machine is broken. Okay, no, no. Endpoints in in are not guaranteed by Rolle's theorem. Interior points are guaranteed. Okay, so then let's solve this. One over, one plus, one minus one over x squared is zero. So we already went over, we went through this, so then there were two algebraic solutions, x is negative one or x is one. So I found these two solutions and then now what? Sorry? Ah, one of them is not in the interval, right? One of them is not in there. So not this one, just this one. Okay, and that's another frequent occurrence. <laughs> Students telling me that the domain is 5 to 10. And I found this critical number over at 137. I think it's really important. I think Rolle's theorem should consider it. 
Well, no. <laughs> okay, it doesn't work that way. Okay, good. So let's do one more thing in the time remaining. Okay, so now, now we have a more general situation, and this one is called the mean value theorem. So the mean value theorem, as far as a picture, has almost exactly the same setup as Rolle's theorem. Okay, so then now, I'll choose some function and choose two points, two x values, x is a and x is b. Okay, so then, x is a, x is b. And now I'm going to select two points except now I'm going to relax. I'm going to drop the requirement that those two points are at the same height. Right now they can be at different heights. They could still be at the same height, but now they're allowed to be at different heights. So then I'll draw t two points that are at different heights. Okay, but we still have the same requirement that in between these two points we have to draw a function which is continuous. It has to be continuous on the closed interval a to b. And it still must be differentiable on what? The open interval a to b. So draw something that is continuous and differentiable. So I'll do that. Okay, so I drew something that was continuous and differentiable. Now, I want you to add to your drawing now the secant line between the two endpoints. So the secant line has this appearance. And so, I want you now to consider in the context of Rolle's theorem, what is the mean value theorem saying? I haven't told you the, the conclusion, but I want you to think about what Rolle's theorem was saying, and I want you to tell me what the mean value theorem is going to say. Yes, there has to be at, one, at least one place where the tangent line is parallel to the secant line. It's exactly the same as Rolle's theorem, except Rolle's theorem was saying that, and, and moreover, I'm going to require that the secant line is horizontal. Right, so this one is the secant line can be non-horizontal. So then, can you see two, two places on my graph? Right? There has to be at least one place, but on my graph, there's two places where the tangent line is parallel to the secant line. So can you see them? Okay, so I would say that maybe about right, ah, about right here is one of them. Okay, there's one. Okay, maybe over here is another one. So, <laughs> there's really no difference between Rolle's theorem and mean value theorem, right? The difference is just, maybe you just turn your head a little bit, right? You just turn it like that. So then, nevertheless, for the mean value theorem, there are two requirements. And then you solve the algebraic equation, the derivative is zero. For the mean value theorem, uh, excuse me, for, for Rolle's theorem, there are three requirements, and you solve the algebraic equation, the derivative is zero. For the mean value theorem, there are two requirements, and you solve the algebraic equation, not the derivative is zero, but the derivative is equal to the slope of the secant line. Okay, so then what is the slope of the secant line in this question? So then, then, there is at least one x equal to c in the open interval a to b such that now the geometric statement is that the slope of the tangent line has to be equal to the slope of the secant line so that is to say that the slope of the tangent line f evaluated at c has to be equal to the slope of the secant line so the slope of the secant line rise over run that will be f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Right, so then now have a look at the right-hand side of this equation. What if f of b was equal to f of a? Then what would the right-hand side of the equation be? Zero, and this would be exactly Rolle's theorem. 
Okay, so then we learned two theorems today. Rolle's theorem and the mean value theorem. For a Rolle's theorem question, you must show that three things are true. Okay, that the endpoints are at the same height, the function is continuous in the closed interval and differentiable in the open interval. And then you must algebraically solve the equation, the derivative is equal to zero on the open interval. If I give you a mean value theorem question, then you must show two things. The function must be continuous on the closed interval. It must be differentiable on the open interval. If it satisfies these two requirements, then you can use the mean value theorem and you solve the algebraic equation. The derivative is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a in the open interval. Okay, see you on Friday. <coughs>